I'd say welcome to another Tuesday morning webinar and uh, happy Flag Day. It is Flag Day. Everybody's wearing flags and uh, and uh, the Bookspan Baker team brought in a bunch of flags. And uh, so uh, so fly your flag proudly and high. But uh, with that being said, this is America, the greatest country on the face of the planet. Well, we're here to make money every day. It doesn't stop. The grind doesn't stop and we don't stop. So we appreciate you joining us this Tuesday morning as we're here to help you increase your bottom line to get more deals and become more profitable as a real estate agent. Here's what we've got going on today. We've got Todd Bernard here to give us a look at the numbers. we got Mick Bernard here from the Bookspan Baker team to give us the Home Streets Mortgage Minute. I'm going to give you a little three-pack on crisis communication. We will, as agents, always find ourselves in crisis mode. Uh, something goes south with the deal. Something's going bad. And, and how you should handle that and what you should expect from the other parties involved. Uh, we have uh, attorney Richard Gramlich here from Tiffany and Bosco. Well, he's not here yet, so we're hoping he shows up. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and don't do that with Bob. So moving right along, as always, if you got any questions and, uh, and comments, whatever the case is, we've got a, been getting a lot of nice comments from everybody, so we appreciate that. Keep coming, keep bringing them in. If you got any complaints, go ahead and email those to Todd C. Menard at <laughs> WestUSA.com. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. But if you got any questions, um, go ahead and email us at webinar at westusa.com. All right, Todd. So what <laughs> it's it's going to I don't know if I want to do an open house this weekend. Why not? 120 degrees. That's why. Not inside the house. You're picking the wrong house. <laughs> no. Oh, yeah. If you are doing an open house make this sure weekend, it has air go, make sure go a couple days beforehand yeah. and make sure the AC works. Well, you know, it's funny. If you've ever gone to any kind of a showroom or whatnot, and people always say, I have to bring a sweater because it's cold in there. Well, that's part of the process is you want to keep the house colder than normal, um, you know, maybe about 66 to 67 degrees. Um, you know, the client may or may not like it, but that's what it's that's what's necessary to keep the people in and staying you know they're hot out there today you're absolutely right mike all right well taking a look at the numbers here we go across the top uh looking at 67 days on market that's fluctuating up and down but it seems to be down quite a bit lately month supply at 4.99 absorption rate at 20.04 average list price at 484.978 sale price at 281.095 and the list price to sale price retention which is the percent of the list price that the final offer uh, was entered into escrow for uh, is 97.45%. Uh, taking a look at our inventory pending and closings uh, across the top, here's where some of the differences are. We're going to talk more about this on the second sheet. Um, so if you want to just tab through, uh, go down to new listings. Um, we're only take we only took 1,971 listings this past week. That's down six percent. Average days on market, uh, as you can basically see down in the bottom right corner, is 124.6. But closed, as we mentioned earlier, is sitting at about 67 days. Um, so looking at the range again, under 500,000 is about 92 days on market. Uh, 100, uh, 500,000 to a million is about 130 days, and the million dollar plus market is sitting at 224. So the average overall is 124.6. Um, so when you're working with your clients, you know that's a great, great sheet to take a look at. So you can see the fluctuations in in the market. All righty. Well, taking a look at the actual uh, statistics and being able to compare to previous time periods. Uh, right now, this is 1,971 listings taken this past week compared to 2,092. Not a big deal, but a consistent slowing. We were up as high as 24, 2,500 a few a couple of months ago. Uh, now we're down to 1,971. Definitely showing signs of the bell curve, meaning that people that are going to list probably have already listed. However, we have the uh, open house event coming up on July 10th. And so we are encouraging you to get out there, pick up the phone and tell people, hey, listen, we've got this big event. If you thought you missed the market, think again. You know, we have this big event coming up. We're going to have 300 open houses across the valley. Uh, I will be coming out to the offices, Kierlin tomorrow, uh, Arrowhead on Thursday uh, to be able to present this uh, in more detail. I had a beautiful time out in uh, Mesa this past week with Kerry and the gang out there. Uh, so please, please please, please. This is not a bad market. This is not a, a, a crisis issue. This is just understanding the cycles of what's going on out here in real estate. Um, taking a look at the uh, active inventory was at 20,971. 
basically, again, under 21,000 now, taking a look at non-depressed properties. Uh, you know, those are under almost under uh, 20,000. When we hit the 19s and that again, we can definitely tell uh, that we are short in inventory. Uh, the 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 closed inventory uh, currently right now sitting at 1681. This is a little drier than normal, but the but basically there's a lot of statistics happening, a lot of things bouncing around here. So, you know, we have to make sure we understand really what's going on. It's a little too early to tell how the month will fill out. Um, so we'll go down to the statistics and finish up down here. You know, last week we reported 2.48 under three months supply. Um, now we're next week, this this week, this past week, bounced up to 4.99 uh, month supply. Uh, our absorption rates are almost cut in half uh, in comparison to last week. It just means that last week we had a great, great month. That's all. Uh, a great week both that week. The, right now we're, we're experiencing a little bit of a uh, slowdown from that perspective. Uh, average list price at 484. That's down just a little bit. Average sales price sitting at 281.095. That's actually down a little bit. Again, a little more co uh, competition in the marketplace and 97.45 sale price, list price retention. So what's it really mean for everybody out there? It means that the mentality is people are going on vacation. Executives, uh, people that are in the workforce, you know, July and August are the two months that they take their vacations. So realistically, listing in June can be a great time because while they're gone, their house can be sold. Um, so you really have an opportunity. Don't, don't, think that the market's over. And other it's executives not. from other states are coming here. Don't know why, but they are coming here and, uh, you know, playing golf and taking the kids to the resorts and good all that point. kind of good stuff. Yeah. Arizona is one of the top five destinations in the world to, to vacation at. So uh, great, great thing, Mike. Good, good suggestion. I right, appreciate it. Appreciate that. As always, these will be available uh, later on this afternoon on the dashboard. Download them, use them uh, during your presentations with your clients. So moving right along, let's find out what's going on in the mortgage world. We've got Mick Bernard here who's celebrating Flag Day with us. Uh, I was hoping those were going to be like edible edible flags or whatever the case I think, is i think they're edible for you <laughs> <laughs> i thought if you pulled the bottom of the string the, the things would pop and there'd be confetti no, all over the place no finger pulling, no finger pulling here okay <laughs> <laughs> please please let's not go there okay i'll uh, let you take it away okay you make, well, you know, we digress it's kind of like a broken record right the rates are pretty much the same and, and on occasion they're up an eighth or down an eighth and they've been pretty much the same for the last month three weeks before that they were an eighth higher and the month before that they're exactly what they were right now and so just keep in mind rates are good uh, keep in mind there are some underwriting guidelines that are changing for fha if you're not familiar with those please give me a call and you'll see the number on the last slide where you can contact us anybody one of our offices to, to discuss that but conventional five percent down 740 score you know if your client's putting more down or willing to pay a point you know they can get their their rate way down to the mid threes if they'd really like to do that FHA VA can buy those down into uh, mid threes as well. And so today I wanted to touch base on um, one of the items that we sometimes highlight, but to, to kind of dig into it's a system called the Nestablish that we use as an online pre approval system that when you uh, send a client to us, it gets pre approved. Uh, you actually emailed uh, that, that letter. If we can, you know, kind of scroll down and talk about some of the other points. Unlimited offer letters. The nice thing about this is, say we, you to ask me to get somebody pre-approved for three hundred and fifty thousand, but then also you want to make an offer at three hundred thousand, and it's Sunday afternoon. Again, this is maybe I, I don't pick up my phone for some reason. You can just go into the system and change that pre-qual to say three hundred thousand. Can we say a million? You cannot exceed the maximum oh, that they've okay. been pre-approved. Hey, it was it was a valid question. You could try, okay, uh, but no, it wouldn't work for that. So as long as you're not exceeding the maximum, and you can print up as many of those letters as you need. So say you offer three hundred, it comes back. You're negotiating, and you end on three ten. And now, in order to, to get it finally signed off on, you need to have that letter at three ten. You just go in, change the number to three ten, and print up another form. Nice. And so you don't have to contact us every time you want to make a change. Um, and so, uh, very simple to use. I can even figure it out if I can figure it out. You can figure <laughs> it out. I trust me on that. And so, and the nice thing about it too is your client. Online. Your client, it's online, and your client is receiving a copy of it as well. You really don't ever have to print one, right? You can just print one right to your phone, or print one right to your computer, and just attach it or include it as a as an attachment with your offer. Um, but here's the nice thing about it as well: is this the buyer also gets a link sent to them where they go in and accept the terms of of our offer to them. But there's also a mortgage calculator in there. Okay. So if you're shopping around and want to figure out, hey, if the taxes are this and the interest rate is that and the loan amount is this, How's it they my payment. Yeah, how does that? What is my payment actually going to be? And many many clients love that about the systems. I think they actually like it more than the agents like it. But um, 
And then, of course, it's, it's online, so it's available all the time for you to use. And so bottom line is we're going to issue a pre-approval for you. You're going to be able to, to change that number to, to match the taxes, match the insurance, match your offer. And so, you know, there's a couple of different strategies there, right? I have, have agents tell me all the time, well, I don't want them to think that that's all my clients pre-approved for. Um, but usually most clients want to just m- want to make the seller think that's the case, <laughs> exactly. right? That's especially what I would want to negotiating, do, especially when you're negotiating. And so if, if you're going to negotiate something differently or increase that price, go, you're go, funny. Go you're actually it. assuming that us real estate agents are actually reading the appraisals that are coming in <laughs> <laughs> and, and know what's on them. We don't read that stuff. You mean, you mean the uh, prequels? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um. <laughs> All right, Mick. Yeah, Mick's that. got nothing. <laughs> Happy Flag Day. <laughs> Happy Flag Day. Hey, if you're going to be one of our offices, you know, I service basically the Arrowhead office and the Mesa office. There's there's flags there for you to come in and pick one up. Please do so. We have some here at the corporate office. They'll be in the training room. Uh, there's plenty of them. Just come by, help us celebrate Flag Day. And, you know, a nice. couple of weeks is going to be the 4th of July. And so it'll kind of get everybody uh, in the spirit, especially right. in this, this time. Of day. And if you don't know what Flag Day is all about because you're too young, go to my uh, Facebook page and take a look. I posted something that explains all about it. Perfect. And then again, the Books Van Baker difference, we're not going to spend too much time on that today because we actually established the online you know, top right pre-qualifi- pre-qualification form access 24-7 is on there. And that's what we highlighted today. You know, next week we're going to talk about a loan story. I just put a veteran, disabled veteran in a house that uh, was turned down by uh, by uh, four different lenders and uh We'll share that. We'll have that information oh, nice. for you guys next week. Very nice. Great. All right. Appreciate it, Mick. And as always, uh, stop by, pick up some flags today. Uh, if you're out and about, and if you might need a flag or two for one of your clients, I'm sure they wouldn't mind uh, letting you take a couple extra ones. Uh, appreciate that as always. And please stop by, say hi to the Bookspan Baker team. They're, all, they're throughout the valley in our offices, and they are here to help you with your needs. All right, a little three-pack. I tell you, Todd, we're always in, uh, in real estate. It is we don't take enough courses on crisis, crises management because every deal seems like we're <laughs> in, say, in crisis, Isn't right? that just real estate in general? <laughs> and uh, yeah, it, and it is. But, you know, I mean, but, you know, it's, it's it's late at night. It's the day or two before closing. You find out something really bad about your client or about the sell. I mean, there's so many different things. And so I was thinking a lot about that. And so I, I came up, you know, because communication is key. It's, you know, it's. It's what life is all about. You have to be able to communicate. So I uh, came up with three crisis communication tips. So when you're facing a crisis in real estate, it doesn't matter whose side you're on, who you represent, whatever the situation is. I mean, you know what a crisis is and and, and you know how to identify what it is. But sometimes as real estate agents, um, you know, we do crazy things in in, in the no, face of the, the face of uh, unfortunate situations. So, number one tip in any crisis that you face is respond quickly. You know, in in the radio business, uh, when we talk about you know breaking news and and especially when bad stuff happens to a politician, company, whatever the case is, uh, you know, the unfortunate incidents that took place in Orlando, Florida this weekend. Of course, our thoughts and prayers go out to everyone impacted and affected by it. But we're always trained and PR people are always trained to get out in front of the story. Don't make people coming, begging to to, to find you, to track you down. Uh, so don't go into hiding. This is what we do. We go, we go into <laughs> hiding. We like, okay, I'm gonna have a couple drinks tonight, wake up tomorrow and, and magically it's, away. <laughs> it's, it's gonna go away. You don't go to bed without dealing with the issue. If possible, though, in any situation, especially with your clients, be the one to deliver the news. Don't let your lender deliver the bad news. Don't let the other agent deliver the bad news because people get irritated with not knowing. And if you don't believe me, how irritated do you get when your lender or title company is not getting back to you? We as agents, we're, we're very irritable in those situations. So the more time that your clients have to, have to stew, the more time they have to think about making a change. And this is where I think a lot of, I mean, I've saved a lot of clients uh, because of communicating with them. And I've lost a lot of clients because of my lack of communication as well. You know, I'd recommend everybody just go out and buy seven levels of communication by Michael Mayer and understand what's going on. It's a great read, but you know, in the end, it really boils down to expectations. If you're communicating with your clients and you're setting expectations at each stage, you know, inspection period, negotiations, any of those types of things, uh, then, then it it allows them to see the business unfold in front of them. They go, Oh yeah, Todd told me about this. Um, Yeah. He said that this, 
this could happen or, you know, the buyer could come back with an inspection item list, a laundry list of things, things of that nature. But I think the big important thing, Mike, is what you were, what I was getting from it, but was a guy by the do- name of Dr. Deaton um, who built a, uh, wrote a book and it was all about what they call the gap, the difference between an issue happening to you or in front of you or, or within your business and your reaction time, that gap between there. And sometimes sp- responding quickly is important, but responding quickly, it's okay to say to them, I haven't investigated this yet. I'm going to go get some investigation, mm-hmm. but I wanted to reach out to you right away and let you know I know this is an issue or let you know that this is an issue. And I want to let you know I'm not prepared to give you an answer right this second. Let me go back and get some it's more information right and get back to you because, yeah, so many times an agent thinks they got to have the answer that they get on the phone too quickly sometimes. They give an answer, which is actually the wrong answer. Yeah, and or they wait till they have all the facts. In this situation, when you're dealing with clients, I, I love what you said. Get to them, be out in front of it. Let yeah. them know that you don't have any of the answers or solutions, but you're just letting them know because they will appreciate that. People appreciate being kept in the loop. Uh, number two is respond honestly. Okay, it's not enough just to be quick about it, but respond honestly. And I put be as honest as possible um, because there are some situations where you can't disclose certain things or, or whatever the case is. But I, uh, no one likes excuses. Oh, yeah. And we get, and again, as agents, we get really uptight if our lender, our title company, our home warranty company, who, whatever the case is, when they just start giving us the litany of excuses. But then yet sometimes when we're faced with crises, we give excuses. And we know as agents, we know when people are giving us excuses. So don't think that your client your doesn't know oh, when yeah. you're giving excuses. Honesty shows that you care, that you're trustworthy, and that you view your clients like family. And I and I have found, you know, honesty is, and I'd love to have Mick in here again. He left, but um, you know, he would he could attest to this. Honesty is the best way to find the solutions to your problem. Okay, I know lenders get so frustrated when people. Um, kind of lie to them and yeah. fudge the facts. Listen, they're going to find your lend- lenders are going to find out the facts about our clients. And and sometimes our clients don't like to be as honest. Uh, you know, we, we go into the doctor's office and, and we're not honest about our diet or honest about our stuff. Our doctor's there to help us, you know, right. and sometimes we do the same thing where we may not disclose everything. But the more honest you are about every situation, I think the easier it is to find the solution when everybody knows what's really going on. Yeah, you know, and and we talked about it in the first uh, item, but the same kind of thing. I mean, you know, it's okay not to have the answer. It's okay to just, but it's, you want to get in touch with somebody as soon as you can because you don't want to be putting fuel on the fire. Get out, get in touch with them right away. Um, and never, ever, ever dis- speak poorly of the co- your colleague on the other side of the transaction. You know, I can't tell you enough. This is an etiquette thing. This is an integrity thing. You know, we, we are so fast to want to throw the other agent and the other client under the bus Listen, it is what it is. It's part of the process. You know, before we jump to conclusions, let's reach out and talk to these people, try to find some answers, see what's going on. Because there's usually three sides to everything, the buyer side, the seller side, what really happened. You know, so it's just one of those types of things. And and on this item, I just want to leave you with this says that actions leave clues. If you want your clients to think you're a professional, then they will perceive that one way. <laughs> Either you are or you're not by the way you handle different things. And, you know, always stay humble and kind. Yeah, and that kind of leads to then hold yourself accountable. People respect those who assume responsibility. No one likes a blamer. Okay, this, yeah, well, is, what, this, is, this is what my kids do. Okay, <laughs> yeah. they blame yeah. each other. Yeah. Okay, it's never them. It's never their fault. Yeah. And it, we get as parents, we get so frustrated with it. But as agents, sometimes that's what our clients think about us. That okay, my agent acts like a child. Kids okay. get chocolate all over their yeah. face, but they go, "Dad, I didn't eat the chocolate." Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so it shows the highest. I think this shows the highest level of integrity when you can take responsibility. And then there are times instead of throwing uh, my vendors or my partners underneath the bus, sometimes I need to protect them and just take responsibility because I do. I think it shows the highest level of you know of of integrity character yeah. and, and and anytime that we see any of our politicians or or whatever the case is and and something business breaks leaders, in the news yeah. whether it's something that they've done it's always the countdown yeah. of when they're going to actually come out and say yeah i did it okay how long are they going to and, and and so forth and we don't want to be like that we want to be as have as much integrity as possible at the end of the day it's our business it's your business so the buck stops with you you are the ceo of your own company 
And therefore, a CEO of any company knows that the buck stops with them and we need to act like that. Absolutely. You know, I mean, what's the difference between, you know, an average department store and Neiman Marcus, you know, or what's the difference between uh, Nordstrom's? You know, again, it's I'll the, have to ask my wife. because yeah. She'll be able to well, answer it's that the question. Customer service. It's what's the difference between Mastro's or the Ocean Club and just your average restaurant? I mean, yeah, you pay more for, for high quality service, but the person who would be working at the, you know, and, and this is just a caliber thing, you know, the person who'd be working at the old Navy probably, unless they move their way up through that ladder, is not going to get an opportunity to have that same position over at, at Nordstrom's because there's just a different intellect that goes along with different stations in life in different places. And it's the same kind of thing. How do you want your clients perceiving you? Are you just another realtor, um, you know, another licensee, let's put it that way, because let's preserve the word realtor, you know, just another real estate licensee, or or do you handle yourself and, and do business in such a way that admonishes your character and your and your and your and your honesty and, and being humble and kind? I mean, that's that's really what it's all about. Yep. Buck stops with you. All right. That's our three pack for the day. So these are three tips for uh, communication during crisis. All right. A couple of announcements this Thursday. We've got a couple days left. Uh, I don't know how you're doing with sales and leads, but our next six figure mind shift is this Thursday featuring David Kogan. For those of you that were at our entrepreneur summit, you heard him speak, but he's going to share from his vast years of experience and give us all tips on how we can get more buyers, how we can get more sellers, how we can close deals uh, from a corporate level of these, you know, all of our speakers go around, train sales staff, sales teams and executive teams around the nation, some of them around the uh, around around the, the, the world as far as the issue and the element of sales. So we want to encourage you to register for it. We're going to send you a link to it right now. Uh, we've got a few spots left. So that's this Thursday here at corporate 1030 to 12 lunch is included. Uh, we also, Todd, you'd mentioned, I'll let you spend a minute talking about this. Well, you know, again, we this was something that really came about from the shared advertising program we had earlier uh, as that was kind of uh, remorphizing, remorphizing, remorphizing into something else. Just uh, go with it. Yeah, yeah. It's like irrelevant, right? You get a ding yeah. when you make up a word, hey, too. Hey, hey, so here's the thing. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, the point is, is this gives us a kind of camaraderie. It gives us a purpose. It gives us a red, white, and blue philosophy. July 10th is going to be the day where our goal is to put 300 open houses of, across the valley. If you don't have an open house, that's okay. People do have open houses that you have listings that you can sit open. Uh, on the other hand, you may also decide that you want to go hold a spec home, a brand new uh, new construction that's something that's ready to move in. You may want to hold that open if you can talk to them and get approval for that. Uh, but this is a great Great event. If you don't have listings and you want to get your feet wet in the business, this is also an awesome opportunity to, you know, pick up the phone and start and having a reason to contact some people that maybe you haven't talked to in a little while because say, hey, we have this great event. It's going to provide great exposure for your property. Um, you know, if you're if you're considering selling, so this is even something that a brand new agent can use to circumvent the fact that they don't have a lot of experience. They can just kind of sell the idea the the. Of, of this big event that's going on and, and getting the consumer to, and we didn't want to leave them out, getting a consumer to participate. So, so attend yes. your office meetings. We'll be coming around talking a little more about yeah, it. Yeah, and, and it's important to note, even if you don't have a listing, we, right. we, we, your office manager, we will help you find a house to sit. And then on July, and we didn't make a slide for this yet, um, but just save the date, write this down right now. But on July 6th, on, on Wednesday, prior to this, uh, Hofstetter and I, we we're going to do a special webinar just wow. on tips on running an open house, just nice. some things you could just implement for that weekend and so forth. Um, so anyways, and lastly, uh, we've got, um, if you are in property management or thinking about getting into property management, this is the event for you. This is all day, or you could do half day, depending on uh, how much time you have and, and, and so forth. But Friday, June 24th, March Lindsay has spent a lot of time, a lot of effort with Sue Fluky putting this thing together. Our instructor is Denise Holiday. Um, this will give you, not only will it give you CE, class, CE hours, but this will give you a great inside view of what's going on with property management issues. Uh, again, if you're even thinking about managing any properties, um, this is a must attend because yeah, you've got to keep yourself out of trouble. Um, you know, Easy, easiest form of our business, this and business ops to get in trouble in. So, so uh, we're going to send you a link out to that, to this event. So 
If you want to just do one of the classes, it's going to be $20. You can either do the morning or the afternoon. But if you want to do both, it's going to be $35. This is a huge, huge oh, savings. Yeah. Uh, we are subsidizing this, uh, to my understanding. Yeah. So get signed up for it. Uh, that is Friday, June 24th. All right. So now let's just move along. Speaking of uh, getting into trouble, I'm sure Richard here can probably tell us all kinds of ways to get in trouble managing properties, <laughs> right? There's a lot of different ways. Mike. <laughs> okay. But let's. Uh, we're going to talk about... Uh, knowing contract deadlines, and I love your title here, Know Your Contract Deadlines or a Good Attorney. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's talk about the financial contingency. Well, let's take it away. What are some of the things? And we want to bring Bob in here, uh, you know, kind of just go back and forth and uh, and so forth. Well, first, Mike, I put this together kind of as a cheat sheet. I went through the current residential purchase contract. I pulled out all these deadlines. Um, there's a lot of them, so I thought I'd put them here. Uh, on these pages. And the reason I have them is if you blow any of these deadlines, two bad, one of two bad things will happen. You either waive rights that your client has or you cause a breach of the contract. So it's important to know the deadlines. It's also kind of important to know how these things work. Uh, starting with the financing contingency, you, you got three days before close of escrow to uh, get out of the contract if you cannot meet the financing contingency. But I put provided here because this is not just a situation where you don't turn in your application and you tell the buyer, uh, seller, hey, I'm sorry, I didn't qualify. Uh, that's not going to cut it. You actually have to step through these hoops. And the contract is very specific. And each one of these bullet points are something the buyer must do before he can invoke his financing contingency. You've got to file your loan application with three days after contract acceptance. You've got to deliver your LSU with lines one through 40 documents within 10 days. You got to come back within another 10 days and do a notice of intent to proceed and, and fill out the remaining lines of the LSU. Uh, you've got to diligently work to procure the loan. And you've got to notify the seller of any changes within 10 days after contract acceptance. And if a change could adversely affect your ability to gain the financing, uh, for example, they want to take some money out and that could result in you not getting uh, approved. The seller has to approve of that change or you can't make it. So these are the hoops you have to jump through on the financing contingency. So so basically uh, it, what I heard you say was if they don't do these things, they can't invoke the the uh, or exercise their option for unfulfilled loan contingency. To, to, in order to make that happen, because obviously they'd have to kind of be in breach, uh, but the way our contract's written, the only way you are in breach is if there's a cure notice written. So if somebody failed to do one of those things, the only way that they could be held in breach, because you said also that they could waive their, their, I don't know, rights, I guess, to certain clauses in the contract if they failed to do something. Is that kind of the where, where you were well, at with I mean, that? The, well, I mean, what did you mean by that? The way this works, there's two ways you can approach this. So if you are aware that your buyer is not doing these bullet points, you can put them on notice of breach and ask them to cure and do that. On the other hand, if the buyer just all of a sudden comes to you and says, hey, I didn't qualify, uh, I'm invoking my contingency to get out, you can say, wait a minute, I need proof from you that you perform these what I call conditions precedent. Mm -hmm. You've got to step, the, the buyer's got to step through these six hoops before they get the right to get out on a financing contingency. Gotcha. This is a good checklist to have. I yeah, mean, yeah. As, a, as, a, as a seller's agent, I'm wanting to ensure all of this stuff is happening and, and making note because, and I wonder how many people, how many agents out there, and I'm and, and talk about sellers agents that where we just have ex accepted the you know the unfulfilled loan contingency and we're just like okay, you know, and we we don't know, yeah. and, and had we known this, we might have been able to protect our sellers a little bit better, kept the earnest money and whatever the case is, rather than just letting them walk, walk you know scot free. Absolutely. You should be, when anyone invokes that contingency, you should ask for them to produce evidence that they comply with these six bullet points. Now, now on that same topic, just real quick, um, if someone has, um, I'm losing my point. Never mind. Go for it. Okay. I lost it. <laughs> All right. Gone. Senior All right. moment. So, uh, <laughs> I'm going to let that yeah, one go. Well, Happy you, birthday, you, okay? Thank, thanks. You better let No, it's not my birthday, but thank you. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about the appraisal contingency. Uh, so buyer must cancel due to failure to appraise within five days after notice of appraised value. Let's talk about that. Well, I mean, that's that's pretty simple. The only thing where I think people can get, get themselves in trouble is let's say the appraisal comes back too low and you want to appeal that appraisal. 
I think you can do that. And I think you can agree in writing to extend the contingency for an additional period of time to allow the appraisal process to go through. And if you get the appraised number and it comes back where you need it, great, you, you, you perform. And if you don't, you then say, I'm sorry, I'm invoking my appraisal contingency. But the caution I would make is you either give the notice within the five days of your original appraisal or you get in writing that you have additional time to invoke that contingency. An oral agreement, uh, hey, yeah, sure, take more time, do an appraisal is not enough. It's not going to be binding. What about a text message or via email type of thing? I think text messages and emails are in writing. Okay. I think that's so. Qualifies. So, what happens if the conti- uh, you say that let them know that you're extending the contingency? Does that mean like if they go for a review on the appraisal? Um, we've talked about it in our broker meetings as well. That uh, you know there are certain conditions that don't go along with that extension. I mean, you know, you get to a particular point and you run out of time. And where's the next clause in the contract that covers? timing and what takes place if it doesn't get done? Do, are they responsible for just extending it or that, should they have additional language that has some kind of other terminology in it? Well, remember, the contingencies are in place so you can get out of a closing. So as long as your contingency is still prior to closing date, you can extend it. And so what you would do, for example, is you would say, look, I'm going to I'm going to get this appraisal reviewed, see if we can get it up a little bit higher. I would like an additional five. I would like my contingency to an extend to five days past receipt of the appraisal review. And now you, and as long as that's all prior to the close deadline, then you successfully extended your contingency. If the review doesn't come back in time or it doesn't come back where you need it to be, you can still invoke your contingency and not close. Okay. Uh, how about title defects? A buyer must give notice of disapproval of title items of within five days after the receipt of the title commitment. And again, I know Mick didn't get my joke earlier, (laughs) but this is assuming that as agents that we're reading the title commitments and the schedules and and the title reports. Well, you need to do that because that title commitment is going to have a list of exceptions of record on the property. Uh, There could be easements you don't know about. There could be litigation involved. There could be a notice of list pendants. So you need to get that title commitment, immediately review it, and advise your clients, hey, here's some adverse things that came up in the commitment letter as exceptions. Do you want to move forward with these, or do you want to invoke your contingency? Like if an agent was told by their buyer that I want to put a pool in the backyard, you go to a house and backs to a major road, but it's a really pretty uh, you know, backyard and big enough for a pool. It's 60 feet deep, let's say. Uh, there could be some underground PUEs, public utility easements or things like that that run along that backyard that prevent that pool from being put in that backyard. Even though it looks big enough, it maybe isn't. And sometimes those things are disclosed within the uh, provisions, the you know, s- items B, section B of the uh, title report. Yeah, anything of record will be disclosed. And that becomes an agent's responsibility because the client said to you, I want to have a house that I can put a pool in. Exactly. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I mean... I don't know. I'm not sure a lot of agents. I mean, we don't. Let's just face it. As agents, and I'm an agent, we don't pay a lot of attention to these title reports and, and, and so forth. And we don't read them. Uh, but even if we do, I mean, you know, the minute and this is the thing, the minute that the minute that we receive something from anyone, in many cases, the clock's ticking. You got five we, days. <laughs> five That's days. it. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, Disclosure deadlines. Let's uh, go through each one of these. So I list there's the, these specific deadlines are spelled out in the contract under disclosure. Most of them are within five days after contract acceptance, but you'll note some of them have a longer period. For example, the SPDS, you've got to give notice of disapproval within five days or within the inspection period, uh, whichever is later. I, I want to bring Bob in here for just a second. Okay, we're throwing out a lot of days, and let's just be clear. When does day one start? Day one start. It starts after you get the notice. Okay, so if I get a notice at 11 o'clock at night, the following day is day two. The following, it, no, it's day one. Yeah, but the contract says you don't count the day of the event in counting your days. It's right there All in right. the contract, and it says so. And as a matter of fact, I was part of that. Uh, contract committee that wrote that to make sure that people know when a day is. Uh, the next one, insurance claims history. You know, first the seller is supposed to deliver that report and uh, it's supposed to be a five-year claim history. So as a buyer, you want to make sure you get it from the seller. 
And once you get it, again, you've got to look at it, and you've only got five days or the conclusion of the inspection period, whichever is later, to give notice of disapproval. Uh, Lead-based paint, probably not an issue for a lot of the homes nowadays, but once you get that, again, the seller's got to give you that report uh, within five days after contract acceptance. Buyer has either 10 days or I put a blank line. This is one of those situations where the contract allows you to fill in a longer or a shorter period uh, after receipt of that report to conduct your inspection and either cancel within the five days after receipt of the report or within uh, five days after the exp- inspection period expires. That's, wanna, that's very rare for anybody to have any information on the LBP uh, b- because they, they haven't lived there prior to that time. And if they have, they don't even remember it. Yeah. So it's it's kind of tough. It's it's up to a buyer to make sure they're satisfied with what they're getting. Yeah. And I, w- I want to just real quickly, uh, Richard, go back to the insurance claims history, because this is one of those things that just always falls through the crack for whatever reason. Right. And as agents, even if we can't get the seller to to issue it, we have ways of being able to do it. I know I know Jeff Grant here from Gecko Equity Group. He he'll do it free for West USA agents. But prior and in, in, in my opinion, prior to completing and submitting a binzer as the buyer's agent, we should not only have the inspection report, we should have the spuds, but we should also have the clue report so that we can include any items of disapproval and 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 not be in that unfortunate situation where it's going to come back to haunt us after the 10-day inspection period. Absolutely. Uh, the final one, this is kind of one you don't run into very often, but if you are selling a home in an unincorporated areas and it's five or fewer parcels, there's a requirement for an affidavit of disclosure that the seller has to provide within five days after contract acceptance. And the buyer has five days after that to indicate a disapproval. Well, as a matter of fact, a bank will say, no, I'm not going to do that. If they're the owner. Yeah. Oh, they're not going to. Yes, they are. It's a law. Yeah. And they're obligated to per the contract. All right, so let's uh, go to the next slide here. Let's see what we're going to All right, changes during escrow, huge, huge one. Uh, so let's talk about the first one. Seller shall immediately notify buyer of changes in the premises or required disclosures. I don't know if I've ever seen a, a, a seller disclose, hey, we just changed the premises. Well, and here's you know, what's if- funny is this is a duty to supplement. <laughs> and so if, uh, you know, you, you fill out your spud sheet, and the day after you submit it to the buyer, you get termites. Guess what? You've got to disclose that. You've got an obligation to immediately supplement disclosure. Let's say you uh, you fill out your spud sheet, uh, the, the house is in escrow, and all of a sudden something changes, the pool motor goes out, or something happens adverse to the property, or it gets vandalized. You've got to let the buyer know you have a duty to supplement. And once the seller does that, quote, immediately is when they're supposed to do it, the buyer then has five days to give his notice of disapproval. Interesting. I know a lot of you are, um, I mean, we've got a lot of questions coming in. So I want to just encourage you. Uh, we do have Richard's contact information on these slides. There's his email address. A lot of the questions coming in, they're great questions. Um, and so you can also contact one of our brokers. So just wanted to point that out. All right, inspection period, I'll let you take this one. You know, I I probably could have filled some more things in, so I'll just verbally put it in. But basically, this is one of those areas where you have a presumptive 10 days or whatever day you want to complete after contract acceptance to perform any inspections you want. And and basically anything that you want to inspect, Uh, you can go in and uh, open up walls and look for mold. You can uh, pull out plumbing. You can do all kinds of things. Uh, You should be checking not only for the listed items here, termite, flood, sewer, swimming pool barrier, but you can do searches for sex offenders, the applicable zoning, building code violations, you name it, even destructive testing. But the caveat is buyers got to pay for it and buyer can't damage the property. So you've got to put it back. So if you want to open a wall, because you heard there was, a, let's say the spud said there was a flood in a bathroom and you want to open a wall to make sure there's no mold, you can do that, but you got to put that wall back 
and you have to pay for it. Or you, maybe you heard Jimmy Hoffa was uh, buried behind one there of you these go. walls somewhere in one of these houses downtown yeah. Phoenix. Um, let me ask you this. Um, can, I mean, especially when, you know, if we're going to remove a wall, we'll do whatever the thing is, and depending on how detailed these inspections get, can the buyer themselves physically do this? Sure. It's the buyer or any experts they want to bring in. And the contract allows this to happen. So if your seller says, no, I'm not going to have you come in and open a wall, they're actually in breach of the contract. The contract gives you the right to make those inspections. And if the seller's not going to let you do it, that's a breach. You have to notify the seller that you're going to do it. You, oh, you have to notify the seller. And, and, and like anything, it, all contracts imply reasonableness in how they're being performed and interpreted. So you can't say, I'm coming over tomorrow night at midnight and we're going to tear open walls. Okay. <laughs> right. So you've got to be reasonable about it. But as long as you're willing to pay for it and repair the property and restore it, seller's got to let you do it. Interesting. Um, if seller doesn't let you do it, or if you discover something, let's say a whole wall full of mold, then obviously you've got two options. You can immediately cancel the contract, or you can require the uh, seller to correct. Um, if if uh, you have you've sent that request in to correct, the seller has to respond to your notice of disapproval within five days, or again whatever other day you may agree to in the blank, and they have to complete those repairs within three days or whatever other day you select prior to close. Okay, this is, we need to talk about this. This is, I mean, we, we, we get, there's a lot of confusion out there. I think a lot of agents, including myself, I'll throw myself into this, this category of just assuming that they're all repairs as long as they're done by the time we close escrow. No, no, it's three days is what the presumptive is in the contract or whatever you fill in. And I, I'll tell you, if it's a major repair, I'd want to put like 10 days prior to close so my expert can come back out and inspect and make sure that the seller has corrected what he was supposed to correct. All right. So then what we're saying is then, and, and maybe Bob, you can jump in here when we're completing the Benzer and we're asking for repairs, we need to start putting in dates like within this to be repaired within X amount of days, this to be repaired within X amount of days. You could, you could or not. Well, and it's it's X days prior to close. It's not fix it within 10 days. It's fix it within 10 days prior to close. Yeah. And if you don't put in the number, then it's three days prior to close. That's what the contract provides. And your, your length of time for the uh, inspection is 10 days. And I contend that that's not enough days. No. I There's mm -hmm. more to it. If you're going to buy a $300,000 house, you need 15 days or something, something a little longer than 10 so you can put that in there, and if all parties agree, you're, that's what it is. Yeah, and I would always suggest additional time for your inspection. Um, once the buyer submits the binzer back to the seller, the seller has to agree to fix in writing or refuse, and the contract's canceled. So don't accept, a, oh, yeah, I'll take care of it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because I promise you'll be calling me about – well, he said he would take care of it. And I would say, well, what was he going to take care of? What was the agreement? Oh, I don't know. It wasn't in writing. Well, then you don't have an agreement. <laughs> <laughs> um, again, uh, and then buyer has five days after delivery of the seller's response uh, to cancel uh, or after expiration of the response period, whichever occurs first, or waive those claims and say, fine, don't fix it. We're going to close anyway. All right. Remedies. Parties have three days to cure any potential breach of contract. Don't worry about hurting another agent's feelings. Right, Bob? We sometimes don't want oh, to write these. Oh, that's three, what these they <laughs> all worry about. Well, yeah, but I don't want to cause any problems. Protect you and your client. Okay, that's the big. You don't want to hurt your client's feelings because that's when it ends up in litigation. Yes. Well, you know, the first thing I always ask people when they say, oh, so-and-so breached the contract, as I say, did you give them notice and a right to cure? <laughs> and 80% of the time, what's notice and what's a right to cure? Well, if you didn't do that, then you can't urge a breach. And, and if you're too nice to give notice, hire me. I'll be the bad guy. I'll give them notice. <laughs> I always say, call your broker. I will be the bad guy for you. Say that your broker caused this. Yeah. I'll, I'll answer. 
All right. So as always, uh, Richard, we appreciate your time um, and your phone number is up there. Your email address is up there. What in, in short, what is it that you can provide for us as real estate agents and our clients and kind of give us a, you know, 60 second commercial of your business and, and what, you know, why we would want to use you? Well, what I primarily well, if do, you've been sued, if you get well, noticed that you've been sued or if you need to sue. I mean, lots of times if you've been sued, you're going to have an insurance policy. Your broker is going to have it in place and they'll find you defense counsel. Um, although you get, you get what you pay for sometimes in that situation. Um, but if you're looking as primarily as a seller and you believe someone has breached their contract or not performing, come to me ahead of time, because lots of times. I will kind of set up the breach. I'll make sure, and I'll, and I'll ghost write letters, and they can be very nice letters with no legalese to kind of set up the breach. You're covering what you need to do as far as giving notice and, and giving a cure period. And then when they don't perform or they don't comply, then you come to me, and all of a sudden the hammer falls on lawyer letterhead, and you've been in breach, and you were put on notice, and, and either do this or, you know, if we need to, uh, we'll do demand letters. We'll file uh, litigation, whether it's litigation to enforce a contract. I mean, you have a right to actually enforce the contract and make them buy the property. Um, or if you don't want to do that, sue for damages. And that's and that's what I do. All right. And, and it's important to note, I mean, obviously with the logo up there, you're with Tiffany and Bosco. Anyone in real estate that's been around knows your guys' reputation. You guys do a top-notch job. I personally think as real estate agents ourselves, we we need to have uh, we need to have a lot of sources, a lot of thing, a lot of resources that we have available to our clients. Uh, but I would also you you need to to have this number down, get some business cards. You, you need to have an attorney that that you can automatically just know if you you have a situation that arises. This is where you're going to send your clients to, and highly recommend you guys. So I appreciate you stopping by. I, I know Bob's not going to let you go, but go ahead. Well, and I appreciate that too. It's funny everyone knows Tiffany and Bosco because they did about eighty percent of the foreclosures. We actually have fifty five lawyers over there. And we have lawyers that specialize in all kinds of contract. Are you the toughest? I mean, can I'm you the, beat I'm up the, the rest I of the attorneys? I am the tough litigator at the No, firm. I'm talking about with the other attorneys in the oh, office. Yeah. Can you take oh, yeah. them all? Yeah. My nickname is Bulldog. Yeah. I don't know how I got that, but uh, <laughs> that's my nickname. All right. And, and we're going to, I know Bob's not going to let you leave. So uh, if you wouldn't mind sticking around, but we're going to do a little don't do that with Bob. Bob's going to help us stay out of trouble and uh, with an attorney to back you up here. What do you think? Okay, I'm going to hand this to, to Richard right now. Here, <laughs> uh, We're on the clock, Bob. This is one that I've already answered. Here's a question down here. Uh, this is this is fun. Uh, and here's my answer up here. But uh, read the question, if you would, there. And I'll go on to, uh, to another one here. Um, here here's, a, here's a classic that came around again. Husband can transfer his home title to girlfriend. Chris Combs has written this again. Of course, he had written it in 2006 because I have it on my computer. But here it is again. My father and mother lived in their Glendale home for more than 30 years. Two years ago, my father moved out of their home to live with his girlfriend. Last month, my father went Croke City. Uh, died of a heart attack. In attempting to organize the paperwork of my father's estate, my mother and I discovered a quitclaim deed recorded two years ago transferring the Glendale home from my father to his girlfriend. So th there they have the home. Now, who owns the home now? So as it, we go along, I'm not going to read this whole thing, but as it goes along here, the girlfriend and the uh, wife own the home now in equal shares. Well, they, they don't know what to do, and the wife will not talk to the girlfriend. The girlfriend tried to say, hey, send me 25000 and we'll settle this right now. And I looked at this, and I thought, oh, my God, why don't you get on the phone and settle this for twenty five large? You bet. I mean, that's my thought on the thing, because what if it's a three four $400,000 home? Um it seems like they would settle it, girlfriend or not, you know. But this is what can happen by improper work on these things and taking deeds. And you need to consult an attorney. Richard, you guys can take care of something like this, I'm sure. And, of course, Chris 
Combs is here saying he can take care of it, but uh, he's not here today. <laughs> well, and, and I'll tell you, in a situation like this, assuming that the property was held as joint tenants with right of survivorship, now wife and girlfriend are the joint tenants. And until yeah. one of them dies, they're right. joint tenants. Then the other tenant becomes the sole owner upon death. Now, I wouldn't suggest knocking off the girlfriend. However, another option. You know could, people. Another, I, know I do people. know people. I am Italian. <laughs> but a, another option would be to sue for partition. And you could actually bring a lawsuit and say, you know, Judge, we want you to partition this yeah. property, determine its value, split it up. Someone has to sell it. Someone has to buy it. And that can resolve that issue. All right. Here is the question in the email that Bob had handed to you. So um, an email Bob got, it was a question about the spuds. If the home was vandalized, vandalized while vacant, is the seller obligated to explain this in the spuds or is it OK to explain what happened when the buyer's agent asks why there are holes in the drywall in almost every room? Also, must you state that in the MLS? <laughs> <laughs> I think this is an easy one to answer. The contract, as we covered earlier, requires you to supplement your SPDS. So if you become aware that someone va vandalized the property, whether you did it or not, it's, it's a material condition to a buyer, and you have to disclose it. Yeah, because you can't assume even though all buyers should do a final walkthrough, but they can waive the right to final walkthrough. So there, you have a possibility of a scenario that the, that the buyer yeah. doesn't see the property until after they close escrow again. And I would assume that's one of the reasons why you've, you would need to modify the, the spuds. Let me ask you, this is a true situation that happened to me many years ago. During, during the escrow period, and speaking of spuds or whatever the case is, what if a – a crime occurs in the property during the escrow period or a death occurs or murder, whatever the case is. Oh, I think we've got some Arizona case law that says, uh, unless it's like really atrocious, like, you know, an ax murder or something, crimes and murders and deaths are not material conditions that have to be disclosed. Uh, if it's something, you know, really egregious that could actually stigmatize the property such that no one wants to buy the house because, you know, the ax murderer lived there possibly that could trigger a disclosure obligation hmm that that's something here's a developing story i have here i've got a couple of agents down here that that have a uh, they had the home listed it's a vacant house a doctor owns it he's too busy to care about too much of it he just tells them to take care of it anyway it's vacant and they went over there to relist it again because it fell through. Now they want to do it again. And there's people living there now in just a short period of a month or something like that. And they have the lights and the water on. They had this home sold and it fell through recently. Are these squatters or trespassers? Uh, and is there a difference? Uh, I told them to call a, uh, have the owner call the police. He says, I don't want to call the police. You call the police. So I cleared it with Dale and we're going to let them call the police. Well, I, I'm not certain whether it's important to characterize them as a squatter or, or a trespasser. There's somebody in possession of the property right. without legal right to be there. Unfortunately, calling the police will probably not handle the situation because the police are not going to evict somebody out of a house, especially when the people say, what do you mean? We're the tenants. We've been paying rent. So yeah. you have to do a forcible detainer, uh, which is a process. You go off to your justice court. You pay a filing fee, and within five days, you get in front of the judge and have these people evicted. That's the only way to get people out of a residence is through a forcible detainer proceeding. And a couple of Italian buddies that you know. <laughs> or some Italian buddies. <laughs> well, you know, there's there's ways, but uh, you, you, the forcible detainer is the way to go. Uh, here, here, here's on. Here's another one uh, that one of our agents got. He went and registered some some people at this new home subdivision. And uh, they let him register. Now they say here, they sent him a letter in, our agent. After receiving your broker registration, dated May 13, 2016, uh, they checked out their data bank and noted that these buyers... Uh, visited our community on March 22nd, 2012. Did you hear what I said? Yeah. 2012 and have been receiving information from us since that date. Therefore, we're not going to honor the registration. Isn't that something? So he sent me this letter and I thought, well, 
I, I guess they can do that. Uh, but he said they haven't bought a property yet. And he says, <laughs> and I'll be checking them in at other properties and see if we can sell them something else. But my goodness, and this comes from Pebble Creek, a Robeson Resort community is where the letter came from. I have it right here in my hand. I mean, that's surprisingly short-sighted on behalf of the builder. Uh, in Arizona, you have to be the, quote, procuring cause to earn your commission. Um, if, if the people had come to the property just months before, and then he and he brings them back just months later, there's a good argument you're not the yeah. procuring cause. But this is four years before that the people yeah. were at the property. And I would argue that after four years of time, the, the, new, the new agent is the procuring cause for the new visit. Well, I think what, and this is a good, a good argument, I, I, as much as this irritates me, on the marketing side, I see where they're coming from because they're saying, yeah, it was four years ago that they came in, but we have been sending them marketing materials. And I think their argument's going to be of, of, okay, now the agent's got them as a client. And who's to say the client said, hey, I've been getting all this marketing material from, from Pebble Creek and take me over there. Well, I mean, that's going to be the issue was the ongoing communications from the builder, the procure, procuring cause. But if, the, if it was, why did it take four years yeah. for the for the um, potential buyers to come back to the property? It seems to me the better argument is the, the new broker or the new agent brought them over there and they're the procuring cause and should get paid their commission. Wow. Um, w- one of the things that I, I don't know if enough time is spent on possession of a property when do you get possession it tells you right here at close of escrow did you really think that through when you presented the contract to the seller the seller signs this thing and you know it's not a big deal uh well yes it is in some cases because being the broker i get the calls on these things these these matters are pretty contentious as a matter of fact So what do you have to supply? You have to give them the keys. So to deliver possession, occupancy, existing keys, and or means to operate all locks, mailbox, security system alarms, and all common area facilities to buy her at COE, code of ethics. (laughs) No, that means close of escrow or a, a certain other date. Well, now, did you ask your sellers? If it happens on this date, can you be out at that moment? That moment, not not three hours later, that moment that it closes. Can you do that? And I doubt that anybody ever asked their clients that. So they they ought to think about that because it, it comes around and uh, we get the calls and agents are screaming, everything going on like that. And once in a while, it really gets to be a sight. But that's one of these things in these contracts. As you go through here, did you read every word of it? Do you know what this thing says as an agent? I hope so, because there's a lot of stuff in there. And just as a caveat, if you're going to fill in a different time period for possession, you can do it any time after close of escrow. Don't do it before. You put the, the, the buyers in possession before close. It could be five hours before close of escrow. And they don't close, you can't get them out of now and without a forcible retainer action. Yeah. And yeah, I've gone and, into that before too. And if you're going to do post possession, you got to make sure you got the insurance locked up properly. Oh. Because you're no longer the primary occupant. And I get those calls, and the first thing the agent says, I know you don't like this, Bob. I said, <laughs> yeah. yeah, you got that right. Post possession. Uh, so there they are. They're still in there. And then after they move out, everything's always wrong, isn't it? Yep. Well, I didn't know that uh, underneath the couch looked like that. Of course you didn't. You didn't lift the couch up. So the inspection failed you. <laughs> Where are we at? All right, we are uh, about wrapped up. Richard, appreciate you joining us. As always, like us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash West USA Realty Inc. Leave you with the quote of the day. We're going way back to Plato. Wise men speak because they have something to say. Fools speak because they have to say something. That kind of goes in line with all the communication and the, and the three-pack we've been doing. And, and uh, Google that. Yes, and the flag. Rob, Google Robin Williams, the flag. It is flag day. Happy flag day, everybody. And uh, go out and sell a home. <laughs>